And uh, the way the talk is going to go is, first of all, we're going to talk about um, scoring matrices which are not position specific. So position independent scoring matrices. Where does PAM 250 come from? I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but hopefully by the time I'm done, all this stuff is going to make um, seem a lot more reasonable, and hopefully it will also make a little bit more sense. So we're going to go from position independent scoring matrices to position specific or position dependent scoring matrices. And then we're going to show how SciBlast uses these to do a much more sensitive search. And essentially what it's doing is automating the process that you guys were doing yesterday where I said search with additional sequences. It's going to do that, it's, it's going to do that automatically. And it turns out that position specific scoring matrices are widely used for doing phenotype prediction with SIFT and polyfen. So we're going to talk about that really pretty briefly. And then we're going to end up talking about hidden Markov models which are just a more sophisticated version of position specific scoring matrices. And we're going to do that a little bit so that um, later today when Aaron talks about genome annotation, um, he can, you've heard the word, heard about positions, uh, excuse me, hidden Markov models. All right, so I want to build a scoring matrix. I'm going to build a scoring matrix for, um, this is going to be a DNA scoring matrix because there's only four letters for DNA. And uh, I'm going to go sort of go through the process that is used to actually get the numbers, all right? So here I have, um, I'm, I have a, st so basically what I'm showing you is a whole bunch of different possible transitions. So I'm going to have, I'm going to be an A, and I'm going to build the transition probabilities for an evolutionary distance of one PAM. So that means that 99% of the time, I'm going to stay an A. So have and, and most of you seen some kind of a graph like this where this makes sense? We're looking at uh, these, these transition probabilities. So if I'm in state here, I'm going to stay in that state 99% of the time. And 1% of the time, I'm going to mutate into a C or a G or a T. Okay? And in this particular way of doing things, I know that transitions are different from transversions, right? So I'm going to make it much easier for the A to turn into a G than it is for it to turn into a C or a T. All right, and so this is 0.99, which means that everything that isn't point, has, it, everything else has to add up to 0.1, and if I've done the math right, then that's what I've done right there, okay? So this is my little evolutionary model of what happens to an A at a particular position in a sequence after 1% change. 99% of the time it's gonna be the same. It's gonna change 1% of the time, and it's going to change into a G eight times as often as it changes into a C or a T. All right? Does that all make sense? So, and of course, then I have to do that for all four bases. All right? So I end up with this matrix, which is a transition probability matrix. It says 99% of the time I'm going to stay the same, and then I'm going to change, and the frequencies of my changing into these other things look like this. All right? So this is what I'm starting out with. And this is what I'm ending up with. And because these are probabilities, they all have to add up to one. Right. So now what I'm going to do, this is what my matrix looks like after 1% change, because these numbers are all 0.99. And now what I'm going to do is simply figure out what those frequencies are going to be after more change. Okay. So if I have a PAM1 matrix, which I do right there, okay. And this is not a scoring matrix, this is a transition probability matrix. Now what I'm going to do is, I want a PAM2. And the way I get a PAM2 is basically I take PAM1 and I square it. All right, because I've made one mutation, or I've had one unit of evolutionary time, I'm going to have another evolutionary unit of evolutionary time. That just means we're going to take this matrix and multiply it by itself. And so that's going to be shown here. So here is the PAM1 matrix squared. Here is the PAM1 matrix to the fifth, and to the tenth, and to the hundredth, and to the thousandth. All right. So looking back here, with this diagonal is telling us how often we stay the same. And then the other stuff is obviously telling us what we change. So let's just take a look at how often we stay the same in these different matrices. So, so here, if I've got PAM2, then 98% of the time I'm going to be the same. PAM5. 95% of the time going to be the same. These numbers are changing a little bit because the transition and transversion frequencies are different. At PAM10, I'm going to be the same 
uh, it's basically 90%, 91% of the time I'm going to be the same. After 100 changes, I'm still going to be about 50% identical. After 1,000 changes, I'm going out here and I basically almost completely decayed. I've lost all my signal. I'm going to end up being 25% A and C and G and T. I haven't gotten there quite after 1,000, PAM 1,000, but if I had PAM 10,000 here, then these numbers would all be just be 0.25. Does that all make some sense? So these are the numbers that go in the top of that um, expression that we had for calculating a scoring matrix. We said that a scoring matrix, the, the value, the plus 17 or the minus 3 or whatever it is, is the log of QIJ. And these are the QIJs right here. Okay, we've got four I's and four J's because we've got four bases divided by PI times PJ, the probability of seeing the basis by chance. Okay? And so that's just what this says. So for PAM 20, what I'm going to do for my DNA scoring matrix is I'm going to say at PAM 20, the QIJs, for the, if they're the identical, then they're point, basically 0.83. If they're not identical, then they have these numbers that are off the diagonal. I'm going to plug those numbers into this thing right over here. And I'm going to divide by the probability of seeing a particular base by chance. And that's just going to be 0.25 if I assume my genome is 25% ACGT. I'm going to plug. And so here, for staying in A versus an A, and I divide by 0.25, and I multiply by 10. And this is where the magic lambda comes from, because whether I multiplied by 10 or multiplied by uh, 4 or multiplied by 2 or took the log of, to the base uh, 10 or the log to the base E, just doesn't matter. I'm going to have some kind of a scaling factor. But if I do it this way, I get a score of plus 5 for a match. And if I do it uh, for something which is different, so here I've turned an A into a C, it looks like, then I'm going to get a score of minus 11. So this is where scoring matrices come from. I'm giving it to you for DNA because it's easy for me to show you the, ma the, the transition probability matrix for DNA. It's easy for me to square four things instead of 20 things. But you do the same kind of thing for proteins. Okay? So hopefully this makes it seem a little bit less magical. This formula that I've given you is a formula that comes from one way of thinking about these things where when you're looking at the diagonal, what you're seeing is the frequency of the uh, uh, residue basically staying the same. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with uh, the base composition. Um, oh, well, actually, before I say those things. So, so, so here I just said, OK, a t PAM 20 for DNA means plus 5 minus 11. But whether this is plus 5 minus 11, or plus 2 um, minus 4 is really just about this number right over here. It's about the lambda thing that we talked about yesterday. So what really matters for your DNA sequences is the ratio, okay? Because we, when we do our blast ends and our blats and our um, DNA alignments and things like that, we typically don't actually look at transitions versus transversions. We have a match and we have a mismatch penalty. And so here's a table that comes from a paper that Stephen Alcho and Warren Gish published a long time ago that basically says that um, here are the PAM distances associated with different ratios of scores, okay? So if your score is plus 1, minus 3, that's basically a PAM 1. If your score is plus 1, minus 2.5, that's, that's PAM 2. If it's plus 1, minus 2, then it's about PAM 10. If it's uh, plus 1, minus 1, which is pretty close to what BLASTN usually uses, it's PAM 30. Okay? And this is, in fact, the modern. So this used to be the BLASTN DNA uh, thing. And it is, in, it is today, I think, the match and mismatch penalties that are used for most genome aligners. They're using plus 1, minus 3. So they're targeting things which are 99% identical. As, as, as Aaron was saying uh, last night, you could imagine that you would do better if you actually looked at your alignments and noticed they're not 99% identical, they're 99.9% .9 identical. So this is not actually exactly the right match, mismatch ratio. It should have a larger a mismatch penalty. Um, this is what FASTA uses when it does a search. It uses plus 5, minus 4, which is looking for things which are as far as PAM 45. 
which is the best you can do for DNA sequences. BLAST-N is now using something that looks like this, so it's using PAM30, it's not quite as deep. One of the reasons, of course, that we like deep protein alignments better than DNA alignments is because we don't have to worry about PAM45 in the protein world, this is close. We can go out to PAM200 and things like that, but we can't do that for DNA sequences. For DNA sequences, that's as far as we can get. Okay. I have, I have <coughs> yeah. A sure. Okay, so, so, that's a, that, so, let me, so that's a great question. And let me answer, there are a couple different parts to it. So the DNA matrices, they basically look like this, okay? So we have a simple model, we know it, and because, it's partly because doing, do, we, we, we have a balance between doing it right and doing it fast, okay? So for DNA, for BLAST-N and BLAT and the aligners and stuff like that, we don't worry about transition transversion frequencies. We just um, go through and we have a match penalty and a mismatch penalty. For things which are done in a more sophisticated way, so the methods, for example, that build evolutionary trees for DNA sequences, they do exactly what you're talking about, okay? They actually look at the base composition of the sequences. They look at how frequently things are changing as a, ma as a matter of evolutionary branch length. They do a lot more complicated uh, calculations, okay? So they also work with um, this transition probability matrix, this guy right over here, but uh, evolutionary tree methods, at least the sophisticated evolutionary tree methods, are busily trying to calculate, am I at PAM 20 on this branch, or am I at PAM 5, or am I at things like that? And they're doing that calculation, being aware of the base composition, and so on and so forth. So that happens in the, in the phylogenetic world, but it does not happen in the similarity searching world, okay? So that's question number one. Uh, question number two, do the matrices change as we get more data? Mm -hmm. So not for DNA because we're being simple, okay, we're just, and we're sort of having a match and a mismatch is the best we can do. Um, but for proteins the answer is yes, but we had enough data about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. So the original PAM250 matrix was made in the 1970s, maybe 1974. Somewhere, and I'm going to have the, the citation wrong, somewhere in the 1990s, uh, Jones, Taylor, and Thornton wrote up a paper basically where they redid the PAM 250 calculation using all the data that was available then. So when PAM 250 was made, there were somewhere in the vicinity of 2,000 protein sequences. They were working with something in the vicinity of 100,000 protein sequences, and um, they got a matrix which works better. Um, and there now have been a bunch of papers that have been published since then and there's enormously more data than there was uh, when Jones, Taylor, and Thornton published their paper. And there are actually better methods for estimating these um, rates as well. And all of those things don't change stuff very much, okay? So the matrices that we had, once we had a pretty uh, diverse set of protein sequences, um, that was, we sort of were, were, as, were as good as we could get for a all-purpose position independent scoring matrix. Okay, so um, it is true that lots of different organisms have different base compositions, um, and that certainly affects their codon usage. It does not do that much for their actual amino acid composition. So most of what drives amino acid composition differences in different organisms is the fact that different organisms have multiple copies of different proteins. So if I'm in an organism that has lots of kinases, then I might be driven towards the amino acid composition of kinases. If I'm in an organism that has you know, lots of G-protein coupled receptors, it might go a different way. But if you go and you actually sort of normalize for the fact that, if, that, that um, different protein families have different levels of, of uh, amplification in some sense, or more paralogs, um, that problem kind of goes away. Um, most proteins, if you, if you have a, so thousands of non-homologous proteins, you're going to get 
pretty uh, similar uh, amino acid compositions, even from organisms with very different uh, base content. Um, so, am I answered all your questions? Okay, so now though we're going to do what you would really like to be able to do. Okay, so I've talked to you about building position independent scoring matrices, but what we're going to do is now do a better job of searching because we're going to build scoring matrices from the individual protein families that we're interested in trying to find. Okay, so I have to finish doing this one more time though. So this is more, this is Margaret Dayhoff's data. Uh, so this is now instead of having four things, we've got 20 things, I hope, and I think there might be some typos in here, but. Anyway, so she's, she, and this has actually been scaled by 10,000, so this is the number of changes that have taken place after one PAM from her data set. And then she changed that into 250 PAMs, and then she did um, the same kind of math that we did before, and she came up with a scoring matrix. <coughs> now I have to put this slide up. So when I showed you the transition uh, probability matrix, uh, um, the, the the PAM1 and PAM2 and PAM10 and so on and so forth for DNA sequences. I was using this particular way of thinking about those uh, frequencies, um, which is a method which is, uh, there's a famous textbook by German and Eddy um, that talks about transition frequencies. That is different from alignment frequencies, which is the way that Stephen Alter writes about this. So in that uh, handout, or the, th the paper that you have about um, scoring matrices from an information theoretic perspective, he uses this particular uh, thing. The only difference between this formula and this formula is that in order to turn this into that or vice versa, you need to mul multiply by the amino acid frequencies or the base frequencies, and if you do that, if you basically, this happens and this happens, so they're both the same. That's the take home lesson. They're gonna look different. They have different numbers in them, but after you've done the algebra, they're both talking about the same thing. Okay, so now <coughs> we know how to build a matrix. Oh, well, there's one last thing I, was, I should have said in answering your question. So part of what we would like to do when we uh, use the scoring matrices, we would like to have scoring matrices that are good, of, good at finding homologous proteins, okay? So there it's clearly an advantage to know something about what happens in the protein family. But the other thing that we would like to be able to do is to have a scoring matrix which is good at, in some sense, not recognizing non-homologous proteins. So in the protein similarity searching world and the DNA similarity searching world, you've got scores of things that are homologs and you've always got a hundred times as many scores of things that are not homologs. So the other reason that it doesn't matter so much to have the wrong matrix is because most of the non-homologs are going to be well be, uh, sort of described by um, some matrix which may not be perfect, okay? But that takes us to where we want to go, which is to say for a particular family, we would like to have a matrix which really works for that family. So here is a set of uh, proteins uh, structures. This is a, these are RNA binding proteins, so this is one from Drosophila and this is one from a human. And it turns out that if you were to do a blast search with this protein, looking for this protein, and then after you've done it, uh, one blast search, you're not going to find this guy because it turns out that the expectation value for this particular alignment is terrible. It's um, around seven. But if when you run Cyblast and this guy finds a whole bunch of homologs and we build this thing called a position specific scoring matrix, the next time you do the search, you're going to have find this guy with an expectation value of 10 to the minus 8. Because we have built a matrix which is customized for that particular protein. So let's see how that works. So the idea here is that if we look at a particular uh, multiple sequence alignment, so here's a multiple sequence alignment of perhaps an RNA binding protein family, there are places that are very highly conserved and there are places which are less well conserved. And what we'd really like to be able to do is to capture the special information about the conserved places, okay? So for example, here is a column which is really weird, but let's talk about it, okay? And it's weird because we've got lots and lots and lots and lots of glycines, okay? But we also have a whole bunch of uh, polar residues and charged residues. We've got lysines, we've got um, um, asparagines, or let's say glutamine, sorry. Uh, we've got glutamate and so on and so forth. 
So glycines in Blossom 62 are going to look like a couple of things, but they're not going to look like lysines and they're not going to look like glutamates because glycine has just got a hydrogen and a, um, a lysine and glutamate have very different groups. They're different. On our general purpose scoring matrix, we are never going to give them a good score. Okay. But in this particular protein family, at that particular position, we don't, we, we like lysines and we like lysines and we like glutamates. And so what we're going to do is to build a scoring matrix that recognizes that fact. Right. So um, how are we going to do that? Well, before we do that, let's just talk again a little bit more about this difference here. <coughs> so here is an alignment between um, uh, two little pieces of uh, this sequence. So we have, we're going to focus on these three places where we have alanines in one of the sequences. So if I have my Blossom 62 um, position independent scoring matrix, alanine gets a score of alanine, so I'm going to give this guy a score of 2, and this guy a score of 2, and this guy a score of 2, because I don't know any better. Okay. But it turns out now, if I have a multiple sequence alignment, or I've done something so that I have these different possibilities, I know that at this position, I really like alanine a lot, but serine is okay. I've got this position over here, which I haven't put a box in, but it's the same as uh, that position right over there. And the reason I didn't put a box there is because we now know at that position it turns out alanine's fine, but so is everything else. So there's no, uh, there's no information there. There's no conservation taking place. And then I have this third position where, or this third alanine position, where basically I can put an alanine there and nothing else. So now if I know that I have this kind of information about the protein family, then I can go through and I can do a better job of scoring things. I can say that for this alanine, I'm going to give it a really good score. For this alanine, I'm sorry, I happen to know that alanine is not special at all, so I'm not going to give it a good score. And at this position, where it's absolutely conserved, I'm also going to give it a good score. So what's happened here is I have a custom matrix that allows me to really focus on what's happening for this protein family. The downside is I need enormously more data. All right. So over here, Basically, I've got a 20 by 20 matrix. I use that 20 by 20 matrix at every single position when I do the alignment. I just need to estimate 210 numbers. Estimating 210 numbers is not that hard when I've got hundreds of thousands or, or thou, you know, even tens of thousands of protein sequences that are 400 residues long. So we've known this matrix uh, very accurately for a long time. This matrix is another story, right? So the average protein is about 400 amino acids long. So instead of 210 numbers, what I need is 20 amino acids times 400. I need 8,000 numbers. Okay? And uh, so if I need 8,000 numbers, I need data. I need to be able to look at lots of homologs to see what's happening at each of those different columns. Okay? So one of the things I need to say now, and I'll hopefully remember to say it later as well, is that so yesterday I said if you want to do a single similarity search, a BLAST search, you should search a smaller database. If you're doing a Psi-Blast search, which is going to take, have to build up these 8,000 numbers, you need more data. It would ideally be more data that was not very redundant, but you don't want to be looking at 4,000 sequences or 10,000 sequences. You want to be looking at hundreds of thousands of sequences or 500s of thousands of sequences. Once you've gotten there, I doubt whether or not going to tens of millions really helps because as was pointed out when we were doing the workshop just a few minutes ago, the other thing that matters is you need to be looking at diverse sequences. We really need to be able to see all the possibilities that happens at position number 17. We don't want to look at 50 sequences that are 99% identical and five sequences that are 40% identical, okay? It, because the 40% gives us something, but the 99% doesn't. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the big idea here is I need a lot more numbers, but when I have those numbers, I'm going to be able to make a much more custom matrix. Okay. So this is where uh, pairwise similarity scores come from. It's the log odds of probabilities of seeing things divided by, uh, because of homology, divided by seeing them by chance. And here, so, and, and so here are some numbers. And for profiles, the way that they should come is the probability of seeing is something at a particular position divided by the frequency of seeing it by chance at that position. So instead of saying we have something where an alanine is turning into an alanine or an alanine is turning into a glutamine, uh, a glutamate rather, we, what we have is we have an alanine at position number six. 
or we have a spare gene at position number six, and so on and so forth. All right. So what I want to do now is basically do the same search that I did yesterday morning when we were doing the proton transporting ATP synthase, but now I'm going to use it with Cyblast, and we're going to do the search and we'll watch, watch to see what happens. So you've seen this one before. Now what we're going to, and we, of course what we want to do is to find the most distant homolog in our database. So how's that going to work? Well, the way we did it last time is basically we did a search and then we found that humans found E. coli and then we went down and we bet, did another search and we used E. coli and we got this number and we were very happy. When we do things with Cyblast, what we're going to do is we're going to do our first iteration. We're going to find a bunch of things. We're going to build this position specific model, which in some sense is going to take us down the tree. And then we're going to take the model and do another search and it's going to take us a little farther down the tree. So now the thing I need to say next as I show you this slide is that this slide was designed for teaching you how things work. You should never run Cyblast the way I did it in order to make this slide. Okay? And the reason, the thing that I did here was I used a threshold of 10 to the minus 20th for deciding whether or not something's homologous or not. And that's a crazy threshold, but what it allowed me to do was to basically sort of separate the things which are pretty close in the evolutionary tree from the things that are farther away. All right, so let's see how that works. All right, so I'm going to do a search, and in Cyblast, the first search is just a blast search. It's a blast search using Blossom 62. Okay, so I do my first search. That's right, shown here with the one, and here are the scores that I get, and here are the E values that I get. And I've put a, a, a divider here, or some space in here, because I'm going to see these guys right over here, and those are all better than 10 to the minus 20th. And I'm going to be using 10 to the minus 20th, which is completely artificial, don't use it, um, to stop the iteration before I go to the next one. Okay. So now what I've got is basically um, you know, four vertebrate and one fruit fly ATP proton transporting ATP synthase because they all have E values better than 10 to the minus 22nd. I'm going to take these five sequences and BLAST has already aligned them to the query sequence, so BLAST has given me a multiple sequence alignment. It is a not even a tiny bit sophisticated multiple sequence alignment. It is a quick and dirty multiple sequence alignment. It is totally driven by the query sequence. I've never compared sequence two to sequence three. I've compared one to two, one to three, one to four, one to five. But that is a multiple sequence alignment that I can use in order to build my position specific scoring matrix. So having those five sequences, I am now going to build a new scoring matrix. And I'm going to do a blast search with that scoring matrix instead of Blossom 62. And that's what I get when I do iteration number two. And so what happens when I do iteration number two is that all of a sudden these two guys from a yeast and that's probably some other fungus, um, all of a sudden they weren't 10 to the 20th before and now they are. The other thing that happened is all the guys that were included from the first round, these five sequences, with the exception of this guy who was identical to himself, everybody else gets a much better E value. The reason that they all get a much better E value is they're part of the model. They've been included in the position specific scoring matrix. They know the answer to the test. Okay? So you cannot use an E value here to talk about whether or not this guy belongs in the family. All right? Because he was already included in the family whether he belonged to it or not. So you always have to look at the E-value before the sequence has been included in the position-specific scoring matrix. Okay. So now I've got this guy. I've just added these two sequences, these two fungal sequences. Now I'm going to build a second position-specific scoring matrix. So this was Blossom 62. This was my first position-specific scoring matrix. This is my second matrix. And now, because these guys have been included in the matrix, instead of having expectation values of 10 to the minus 21st, now they have expectations of 10 to the minus 50th. They've gotten really good. And a whole bunch of other guys over here have gotten really, really good as well. Okay? And I think I have some typos in here. I apologize for that. But 
Um, so now I can build another position specific scoring matrix including these guys and it turns out that we end up finding all these guys and we don't find this stuff over here and so um, that's as good as we get. So this is a very artificial case because I'm using 10 to the minus 20th. If I were using 10 to the minus 3 and I did the same search, basically in two iterations I would have found all the proton transporting ATP synthases in my database. So, but what I'm trying to do is to sort of focus on what's happening to our position specific scoring matrix. So the next thing I want to show you is one of the multiple sequence alignments and then what that actually means as far as looking at the scoring matrix, which is what you were doing earlier in the workshop. So here is a cluster alignment of the first uh, four, five sequences that got included. And you can see that there are lots of places which are more highly conserved and there are lots of places which are less highly conserved. If I only had vertebrates, things would not be so interesting, but because I've got that Drosophila sequence in there, I've got something which is pretty distant. Um, so I'm going to build a scoring matrix using this data. Okay, and now what I want to do as I talk about this is I want to focus in a whole bunch of places where I've got glutamines. Okay, so we're going to have this place, and 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 this place. And all of these guys, I'll just say, are, don't look that weird. So here is basically we've got glutamines and histidine. Here we've got glutamines and glutamate. Here we've got glutamines and nothing else. Here we've got glutamines and arginines. And glutamines are polar and arginines are charged. And so all of those things that I just said, they kind of make sense from a biophysical perspective. But there's one place here that does not make any sense. And that's this place right here. I've got three glutamines, I've got a glutamate, and I've got an isoleucine. And everything that we think about as we teach biochemistry and amino acids to um, graduate students and undergraduates is isoleucine is a polar aliphatic. It doesn't have any charge. It wants to be in the middle of a membrane. It does not want to be someplace that a glutamine or a glutamate wants to be. It makes no sense. But in this particular protein family, that's what happens. So what we want to do is then see what that means as far as building our scoring matrix. So here we are. This is actually the position specific scores for our ATP synthase after four iterations. And now I'm showing you, first of all, what happens with uh, Blossom 62. So glutamine gets a score of five against itself, and it's a minus three against isoleucine because isoleucines are not even a little bit like glutamines. And at position number 46, which, so we've got these guys, this is 46 and 47. So 46 and 47, it turns out that we, about half the time, we have uh, glutamine there, and then sometimes we have uh, uh, tryptophan and phenylalanine, and there's some other things over here. Um, so these are the frequencies that you have at these different positions, and these are the scores. So, you know, so it's, we're stronger on glutamine, and we're more negative on isoleucine. At this position, it turns out that its things are less well conserved. There seem to be lots of other amino acids in here. So our strength of the glutamine signal is going to go down. We're going to reduce the score a little bit, but we still don't like isoleucine. But then we have this place, which is just, you know, we're being driven by the data. There's no reason why we would ever guess that this, uh, there sh we should let an isoleucine be in that position. But when you do that, it turns out that after you've looked at a lot, it's actually more data that I'm showing you in that multiple sequence alignment, 46% uh, of the time it's a glutamine, and 41% of the time it's an isoleucine, okay? And then there's some other things that get in there now and then. This makes no biophysical sense, but who's gonna argue with nature? This is what the data says, and so as a result, at that position, I'm gonna give it a score of four, as opposed to minus four, or minus three, and so on and so forth. That's why we like position-specific scoring matrices, because it is building a matrix for this particular protein family, and when it does that, it does a much better job. So, um, how much better? I don't have a slide that shows that apparently, but in general, uh, this kind of work has been done a lot. Um, if you use Cyblast in a sensible way, it is going to uh, be able to identify about twice as many homologs as any given individual sequence. And um, where in studies where people have done things where they looked at uh, lots of very distant um, homologs where structures are known, 
They're going to say that by doing sequence similarity searches, you're going to be perhaps able to identify on average somewhere in the vicinity of 20% of the homologs that are there for these very challenging problems. If you use uh, Psyblast, you're going to be able to identify more like 40%. Okay, so it works about twice as well. Okay. The problem is that it works twice as well, except sometimes it makes mistakes. So let me explain this. Uh, so this is a kind of a graph. It's called a QQ plot. So these, I've done a whole bunch of searches. In fact, I've done 100 searches, I think. Uh, maybe I've only done 50. Um, and if I, do a, if I do 50 searches, and then I t calculate the expectation value for the highest scoring in unrelated sequence, after I've done 50 searches, the highest scoring unrelated sequence should have an expectation value of about 0.02. If I do one search, it should be somewhere around 1. If I do 10 searches, it should be 0.1. If I do 50 searches, it's going to be 0.02. And that's what this diagonal line is. Okay. And what this diagonal line is saying, although it's really hard to see, is that S-search, which is the Smith-Waterman um, algorithm, basically is going to follow that line incredibly accurately. So that's what I say for single sequence similarity searches. And you can talk about size, uh, uh, S search. But if I were to put BLAST up here, it would do a very good job as well. Or put FASTA, it would do a good job. The, ex the um, expectation values you get, the statistics are very, very accurate. If we tell you something is going to happen one time in 1,000 by chance, we actually have data that says it's going to happen one time in 1,000 by chance. The other things that are on here are a bunch of structural similarity searching uh, methods. So this is uh, structure versus structure. Um, and it's not as good, OK? So the problem here is that what it's saying is that these are, this are the expectation values for unrelated sequences. So we've got expectation values that are very, very low. And in fact, they go all the way down over here. I will have an expectation value of 10 to the minus 6th or maybe even 10 to the minus 10th for two structures that I know are unrelated because I know they're, they're, they're structures. Okay? I've seen the structures. They look different. But when I do a structural similarity uh, alignment, the statistics are not so accurate. Um, and over here, so we actually have a, there's, this is Psyblast and this is Dolly. So Dolly is the structure comparison method that has the most accurate statistics. And this is Psyblast. And the problem, again, is that for sequences, for Psyblast searches with sequences, where we know the structures, we know the structures are different. Sometimes I'm going to have an expectation value of 10 to the minus 6th. Sometimes I'm going to have an expectation value of 10 to the minus 10th. So there are big problems sometimes with Psyblast finding things and giving them good expectation values when they are not homologous, when they have completely different structures. Okay. So it turns out we know something about why that happens. <coughs> Um, and the reason it happens is actually because of this problem called overextension. So that's why I was showing it to you yesterday. Because in Psyblast, um, what we're going to do is we're going to keep building these position-specific scoring matrices based on the data that we find. It's absolutely critical that what gets included in the position-specific scoring matrix is, in fact, things that are homologous. Okay? So here is uh, an example of something that happens. So what we've done here is we've got this domain here. This is a PFAM domain that's uh, from this uh, guy right over here. And I'm going to do a search with it. And in the round one, when I'm just using Blossom 62, it turns out that it's going to find this thing in this other protein. So let me be very clear about what's happening here. This green box on top is a real protein sequence with a particular PFAM domain in it. It is being surrounded by shuffled, guaranteed random, guaranteed non-homologous sequences because my graduate student put them there and I know they're not homologous. Okay? It's being compared to real protein sequences in SwissPro. All right? So in the first time we find this guy, it turns out life is good. In fact, we recognize almost the entire uh, domain. It's here are the boundaries. We are missing a little bit of stuff on the Right over here, we've gone right against over here, so things are fine. The next time, and, but the, and this is a distant homolog. It's got an expectation value that's only around 10 to the minus 4. Okay. I then build my position-specific scoring matrix. I do another search, and this gets a little bit longer, and this gets a little bit longer. My expectation value has gotten incredibly better.
because um, I'm using the position specific scoring matrix, I'm much more sensitive. In the next iteration, it turns out that things get much worse. I've got great score here. It's got basically, I've got 300 bits of score. That's fantastic. I have very little extra score over here. I have very little score extra score over here. But the problem is that this very little bit of extra score over here is bringing in this domain. And when it brings in this domain, it pollutes the position specific scoring matrix, which used to be based on shuffled sequence. Now it's not based on shuffled sequence anymore. It's based on this non-homologous domain. And so what I'm showing you here is the number of uh, homologs that are being found and the, the fraction of the homologs that are being found. And what I'm being showing you over here is the number of non-homologs that are being found. So I didn't find any non-homologs with statistical significance after the first iteration, and I didn't find any after the second iteration, but by the time I added this much extra stuff, now I found 100 non-homologs, and by finding those 100 non-homologs, I put them into the position-specific scoring matrix, so now I've got a great position-specific scoring matrix for finding the wrong thing. And so once it's done that, now I'm going to find 1,000 of them, and I'm going to find 2,000 of them. So the reason that the PsiBlast does not have as accurate statistics as S-Search is not actually because of any problem with the statistics. The problem is that it doesn't know when to stop the alignment, so things keep going out there, and all of a sudden they keep getting more and more scores. So you see, the other thing that's happened here is that here we only had 11 bits of score. Now we have actually 70, I mean 67 bits of score. That's really significant. And the reason we've got all this score is because I built a piece of the position specific scoring matrix that is designed to find this particular domain, which is not actually in the query sequence. OK. So that's the problem with uh, the PsiBlast. And the thing which is the most insidious about it is that when this happens, you can't tell. Because PsiBlast is just going along, and it's finding more and more homologs, and life is good. And if you don't have some way of looking at the domain content of those homologs, then um, you don't see that. You don't see that it's happening. What is its use? Pardon me? What is its use? What is its use in this stuff? So most of the time it doesn't do this, <laughs> except when it does. <laughs> OK. So you know, it's doing a really good job here. Here it found basically you know, the first iter this is what BLAST would have found. It would have only found 11% of the homologs. After one iteration, it found 50% of the homologs. It did, you know, five times as well. It didn't make any mistakes. So it's great. Until it's not. And of course, I'm showing you the bad examples. Because that's the papers I get to publish. <coughs> anyway. So um, one of the things you can do to reduce this actually is to um, keep it from making, making this extension take place. Um, and so there's a version of, of SciBlast and also of the, we have a program called SciSearch, which is at the European Bioinformatics Institute that uses some of these tricks in order to um, try to keep the contamination from taking place. And we're working on a new version called SciSearch 2 which um, is going to do even better. It's more domain aware and it's really kind of fun because you can, when you look at the results, it'll give you that color coding. It'll show you, well, in iteration one and two and three, I was always looking at green domains, but now all of a sudden I'm looking at green domains and uh, blue domains, so maybe something has changed for the worse. Okay. So we love SciBlast. It makes things be, you know, on average, I'm going to say twice as sensitive. Um, it does that by modeling the ancestral sequence. It also builds something which is similar to a PFAM HMM, but the HMM is, is more sophisticated. Um, it really works better as you give it more iterations. Sometimes figuring out whether or not it's, something belongs in there is complicated because you don't want to use the statistical estimate once it's been included in the position-specific scoring matrix. You want the iteration before that. And we have a problem that there are lots of protein families where one position-specific scoring matrix will not find all the members. And back um, you know, a long time ago when we were teaching this course, we were showing off SciBlast. We would give the students a sequence to start out with, and they would run a certain number of iterations. And by the time they were done, the thing that they started out with was no longer in the list of things. Because what happened is it went down the tree from one branch of the tree, it caught it onto the base of the tree, and it found lots and lots of homologs from the tree 
but the branch that it started from was too far away and it got lost. So, not perfect. What about like, uh, the gaps and like, this misalignment we saw before between the, the <coughs> Valify did a lot better in aligning it nicer? Because if you insert so gaps that's a, you that's, a, well. that's a good question and uh, we've actually looked at that a little bit. The big problem with Cyblast is overextension. So we've looked at Cyblast using the Cyblast aligner, but you can actually sort of break Cyblast into parts and you can have it use a better aligner in order to um, try to, to do better. It doesn't matter very much. Okay, so this now allows us to talk about SIFT and polyphen, which are methods that are used to predict uh, mutation phenotypes, and we're, we're running out of time. Uh, so SIFT stands for sort intolerant from tolerant substitutions. It works by basically using Cyblast to build a position specific scoring matrix and then saying, okay, at position number 47, turns out that um, I'm, you know, we have lots of glutamines there. I've got an isoleucine now. Is that a bad idea? Well, according to Cyblast, at that particular position, it doesn't matter so much, so it's okay. And polyphen is simply a more sophisticated version of SIFT that does a lot more stuff, um, but it actually doesn't uh, perform much, much differently. So let me just show you these things really quickly from uh, the original uh, development of the SIFT program. So Steve Hanikoff and his, uh, I think it was a postdoc, Pauling Ning, um, were basically trying to look for a way, they were doing some mutagenesis experiments on Arabidopsis and they had an easy way to um, determine what the mutations were by doing sequencing, and they didn't want to do the actual phenotype analysis on all their mutations. They only wanted to do the ones that seemed like they were going to actually have a change, so they wanted to do some predictions. So this was all being done before all the variation data that we have today. Um, so what they did is they looked at sets, some sets of uh, protein families. So this is a particular set of protein families for, um, I think it's probably the LAC operator. Yes, lac I. Um, so over on the top, what, it turns out that at the time they were doing this, and I don't think things have changed a lot, there are actually not a lot of protein families where everybody has made every possible mutation to see which places really matter. Okay? But it turns out lac I was one of those places where they have made every single mutation. So over here, what we have is uh, the number of del deleterious substitutions. So they made every single mutation, and it turns out that here, and here, and here, and these places over here, most of those substitutions were bad. And in places like here, and here, and here, they could make lots of different substitutions and it never mattered. And then the other thing that they noticed is if you do a multiple sequence alignment of lots of lac I proteins, there are these places where everything is bad are also the places where we only allow one amino acid. So this is a, a sequence logo way presentation, and so what this says is, I only want to have aspartic acid, I only want to have valine, I only want to have alanine, and here are places where I don't really care very much, I don't really care very much, and so on and so forth. So when we see things that are tall and only have um, a few letters in them, that means they're very highly conserved, and what you can see sort of visually is these things line up and these things line up, these things line up a little bit less well, this one lines up, and so on and so forth. So um, they, what they demonstrated here with data is something that seems pretty intuitive. If you've got places that can't change, then probably mutating those things is bad. Okay, makes sense. Um, but as I said, they didn't actually have lots of examples where the, which they could actually uh, demonstrate that, but they had a bunch. So um, this now, what they did is they built the SIFT algorithm, which would go through and run Cyblast, starting out with a lac I sequence, find lots of lac I homologs, build a position specific scoring matrix, and then make predictions as to which things are right. And basically, looking at this graph, what we would like to have is all the black things be on top of all the open boxes. So all places like here, and here, and here, and here, and over here, and so on and so forth, those are all places where the predictions are quite accurate. And if you look at places like over here, and over there, those are places where they made predictions that were not correct. All right. So they do pretty well. There are lots of filled black boxes, or filled boxes. And so for their data set, what they looked at is lac I using SIFT. It turns out that you, know, you have different ways of, of quantifying how accurate things are. They can talk about prediction accuracy for being tolerant or for being uh, deleterious or overall and so on and so forth. 
And what this shows is, and it's, I think, very interesting, and for different reasons from probably what they were trying to sell at the time. If you just use Blossom 62, no position specific scoring matrix, a scoring matrix that just knows about what every amino acid likes and dislikes, or is similar and dissimilar, you do pretty well, all right? You get things right about 54% of the time um, for lack I. If you use a position specific score matrix, you, use, you, get, you do better, okay? Instead of 54% of the time, it's 68% 68 accurate. It's not 100% accurate. It's not even 75% accurate. It's much better than using Blossom 62, but Blossom 62 actually gets you a long way there, all right? Uh, here's the same kind of thing for HIV protease, where they've got tons of mutations. Here, it turns out Blossom 62 is going to be right about 70% of the time, and SIFT is going to be right about 80% of the time. So Blossom 62 really has a lot of information in it. And here it is for uh, T4 lysozyme. Uh, Blossom 62 is going to be right about half the time, and if you do SIFT stuff, then you're going to be right about 60% of the time. So it sort of gets things, sometimes it gets things, um, you know, almost 20% better, and it usually gets things about 10% better. So, and this is what people are using today for, you know, in all the databases, all the variation databases, they're making predictions as to whether or not if there's going to be a phenotype, and those predictions are based on things like SIFT, and they're also based on another method which is called polyphen. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Um, and here's some evaluations of how well things work on a different set of proteins. So, um, MAC, uh, this I think is a um, DNA repair protein in P53, BRCA1, and so on and so forth. And um, what it says is that it's really good at finding things, but it kind of overreports stuff. It's going to say a whole bunch of times that things are bad when they're not. So polyphen 2, or polyphen is a, I'm going to say, <laughs> a sift on steroids. Um, so it also makes a multiple sequence alignment. It does a homology search. It has profile-based scores. It has identity-based scores. It has lots of other kinds of things. If a structure is available, it's going to use the structure. It's also going to do stuff with PFAM and so on and so forth. You take all of this stuff, you put it in a big pot, and you mix it, and you do your machine learning thing, and you come up with lots of different ways of weighting the different kinds of evidence, and you come up with predictions. Okay? And so you can then ask the question, which works better, polyphen or SIFT? And that is going to be over here. And so here we have this thing called our ROC curve. Um, but basically, better is it, the best methods are going to go up high and then go like that. So they're going to have lots of area over here. Um, and worst methods are going to be closer to the dotted line. The dotted line says that you're basically not making any accurate predictions. It's just you're making predictions by chance. And if you look at the difference between polyphen and SIFT and some of these other methods, they are all about the same. Okay. So they make, um, they, they, you know, if they don't make any mistakes, but they miss a lot of stuff. And then when they start finding more stuff, they start making more mistakes. Much better than chance, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, in fact, we could be right 99% of the time and, and um, get, find most of the mutations? Um, that's, it turns out not to be true. So um, that's as much as I'm going to say about it. The other thing which is fun about SIFT and polyphen is that SIFT has a scale that goes in one direction and polyphen has a scale that goes in the other direction. It says it. Don't want to do anything which makes it easy to know which is which. Um, so, uh, but they're both somewhere in the 70 to 80 percent accurate range. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a very challenging problem. It's a very challenging problem. <coughs> so now what I want to do is spend maybe uh, 10 minutes, I'm sorry because I'm worried about your lunch, um, talking about, position, uh, about HMM. So HMM stands for Hidden Markov Model. We're going to talk about a particular kind of HMM, which is called a profile HMM, because it's designed to be like a position-specific scoring matrix. It's a profile for a protein family. Okay? And here's some um, uh, reasons why people did it, a little bit of history. I'm going to skip over that. <coughs> Um, I'm going to say, talk about this for a little bit though, because we need to talk about HMMs. So HMMs stands for Hidden Markov Model. We basically have, so a Markov model is some kind of a, uh, a state and transitions. So that's the Markov part. Here we have state number one. Then we're in state number one, we can transition to state number two, or we can stay in state number one. State number two, we can do that, and so on and so forth. So the 
circles and the arrows are the Markov model part. And the thing that makes it be a hidden Markov model is that we have these transition probabilities and a little bit later we'll talk about emission probabilities and we don't know what those are. We are going to estimate what those are by looking at our data. So this is the Markov model part and the hidden part is estimating the parameters of the hidden Markov model, estimating the transition frequencies and the emission frequencies. So here is the classic example of I'm a magician and I'm really good and I'm flipping coins and somehow magicians go to the magician store and they can buy coins which are two-headed that nobody ever looks at. Um, so, or maybe they're not even two-headed, they're worse than that. They are, they, excuse me, they have a head and a tail but somehow the heads come up 75% of the time. That's a very good magic, magician store. But that's the like statisticians like to flip coins. So here it is, I'm flipping this coin, it's a fair coin, it's a 50-50 coin, but then all of a sudden I've done my magical uh, sleight of hand and now I'm flipping a coin and it's a 75-25 coin and the idea is I know I've gone through this process, I've got my true coin and I've got my um, cheating coin and the question is when did I go from the one to the other and what are the, you know, what are the properties of the cheating coin and the fair coin? Is, which one of them is 50-50? What are the head probabilities for the other guy? And the way I'm going to do that is by looking at the list of heads and tails, okay? So I've got head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, 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 head, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then after this has happened, somehow the frequencies of heads and tails has changed a little bit. And I can look at the data and I can figure out uh, the best estimate for when that happened and what these parameters are. So what we're really going to talk about are these profile HMMs. So now instead of having uh, sort of a more general purpose uh, transitions and stuff like that, I have something that looks like this. So let me make th this clear because this is also going to be on the test. Um, we start out in the begin state. We're going to try to align a protein to this thing. We have match state. So here is our protein sequence multiple alignment. So we have lots of cysteines and we have pretty much anything and we have phenylalanines and tryptophanes and tyrosines. And so I'm going to take this multiple sequence alignment and I'm basically going to build a hidden Markov model using this data. And so I know, so basically each one of these match states corresponds to each one of these columns. Okay. And then um, we could also have data where sometimes we are missing one of these columns. So that would be a delete state, okay? So we have a way of, if I don't have any data, if there's no C in my next protein over here, if it just has a V and a W, then I have a dash here, that means I'm in a delete state. Or sometimes we might have sequences that have an extra residue between column number one and column number two, or column number two and column number three. Those are insert states. So I've got match states, which correspond to the columns, I've got insert states which go in between the columns and I've got delete states which allow me to skip the columns. And when I'm in a match state, I have these emission probabilities. So in match state number one, I like to put out C's. That's all there's ever going to be there because that turns out to be what happens in this particular multiple alignment. At position number two, I don't really care very much about what I put out. It seems like I can put out any of the 20 amino acids. And at position number three, I like phenylalanines, tryptophanes, and tyrosines. And so I've got these three things. So it is just another way to build a position-specific scoring matrix. The difference between the HMM and the position-specific scoring matrix is I'm going to put probabilities on these insert states and these delete states, and that, that gives me is position-specific gap penalties. Okay. That's what I get out of an HMM. Okay. So we can go through and we can try to build an HMM from this data. So I've got this position and this position and this position. So I've decided I've got four match states. Clearly sometimes I have something that goes into an insert state and then I also have a delete state over here. So how am I going to do that? Well, here I am in the first state. And in the, so in the first state it turns out, so here's my frequencies in match state number one, my frequencies in match state number two, and my frequencies in match state number three. So these boxes are underneath these squares. Okay, those are just the emission probabilities. But I can also calculate all the transition probabilities. Okay, so it turns out if I'm in match state number, uh, in the begin state, which I, um, that's, this is the begin state, I always go into state number A with probability of one. If I'm in prob state number one, right over here, I go to state number two 80% of the time. That happened right over here. But sometimes, 
I put in an extra residue. I go into this insert state. And then if I'm in position number two, then it turns out that 80% of the time I go to position number three, but sometimes I go to this delete state. And then I end up over here. That's the end state. Okay. So this multiple sequence alignment can turn into this hidden Markov model. Okay. And this hidden Markov model not only tells me what's happening at each of the different uh, uh, columns in the multiple sequence alignment, it also gives me a way to capture frequencies of insertions and deletions. Right. So uh, there's a package of uh, programs called uh, Hammer. It's now called Hammer 3 that is used to do these kinds of things. I'll just tell you that um, the way that it works the best is you start with a multiple sequence alignment because it turns out that although you can use a hidden Markov model method to build an alignment, the al alignments they build are terrible as I showed you this morning. So you build a, a hidden Markov model, excuse me, you build an alignment using muscle or something like that and then you give that alignment to HMM build, it builds you an HMM and then uh, you can go and do a search and it will find lots more homologs and that allows you to update the HMM and go on and basically there's this program called Jackhammer which is just like Cyblast but much more uh, sophisticated and it works um, perhaps a little bit better. It's, uh, yeah, it has a little bit less problem with overextension because this probabilistic alignment is a little smarter. Okay. And so um, I'm just showing you some uh, results. So basically we do a search with one of my favorite proteins turns out finds lots of homologs and then it finds even more homologs and so on and so forth. So initially we have 115 and then we have 279 and so on and so forth. It's like Cyblast. So that's as much as I'm going to say about um, uh, hidden Markov models. Uh, it's, I'm sorry it's uh, such a superficial way of looking at things. But um, it's a very powerful method which I think lots of people are not as aware of as they are of Cyblast. So I really highly recommend it. The last thing I want to say is that all of these methods, just as I was saying earlier on when I was finishing up talking about Cyblast, they all miss stuff. Okay. There are all the interesting protein families are, are big enough that you cannot represent all the members of the family just with one model. You can't do it with one PSSM. You can't do it with one hidden Markov model. In the PFAM world, the way that they address this problem is by having something called clans. So PFAM has all these domains and each domain has a hidden Markov model that will basically find all the domains it can find. But they know that there are hidden Markov models that in some sense overlap with each other and those guys get put together in things called clans. All right. So here's an example of what uh, the problem. So here is a aspartyl protease family protein and this is a glycosyl hydrolase family protein. And if you look at this region of the alignment going from residue 135 or something like that over to residue 300-ish, um, you can see it looks really, really good. No question these guys are homologous. Spectacular expectation value. 60% identical. No doubt about it. So then you could ask, well, how does PFAM label the domains on these proteins? And the answer is that uh, PFAM thinks that there's an aspartyl protease domain on this protein and it thinks that there is a glyco, whatever it is, hydro 9 domain on this protein. This is where the aspartyl protease would actually align to this protein. It, it's totally missing. So all these methods miss stuff. And that's sort of the lesson I was trying to emphasize yesterday as well is, yes, when they find things, those things are there. But when they don't find something, it doesn't mean they're not there. So why do they miss? Because they are incredibly more sensitive than using individual sequences. The reason they miss is because they're building this model, which in some sense is the base of some evolutionary tree, and there are always going to be things, leaves that are far away that the model can find, but then lots of times there are going to be branches, so this sequence is pretty close to this sequence, but it's just too far away from the model. So if I do a search with this guy, it's easy to find this guy, but if I do a search with the model, I can't find it. And that is true for all the methods that we have. We have things where you have to do some kind of a um, uh, using uh, transitivity in order to find things and you can use transitivity basically to find domains which have not been labeled even though like this example I just showed you 
they are obviously homologous. There's no question that that region is homologous. There needs to be an aspartyl protease domain there, but it's not there because this particular sequence is too far away from the model. Okay, so what are the issues? The biggest issue is once you've done something wrong with an iterative method, it's just going to get worse. I've showed you some of those examples um, and it happens. Then the second problem is that if you've got a really big family, you're always going to miss some members that you would be able to find just by doing a blast search. Okay? And then you have this problem, as I said, that sometimes you start out with one sequence and then you actually lose it. So that happens as well. But the good news is it gives you enormously more information about what the critical residues in a protein family are. It's in incredibly more sensitive. It really helps to have lots of data, so you want to search large databases. You're going to find two or to three times as many homologs. They're going to improve uh, phenotype prediction by 10 to 20 percent, um, but we have these problems. Okay, so that's it for all these things, which I could have talked about for three hours. Um, so let's have lunch, and we'll be back here at 1.30, and I don't know what happens then, but it's not me. <laughs>